Australia has an incredible diversity of plants, and those plants make up some beautiful and awe-inspiring landscapes. I think most people who live here feel a connection to those landscapes, or can at least appreciate how beautiful they are. And so, when we see images like this, we feel a sense of loss. The bushfires last summer were devastating, but today I want to talk to you about something else. Something that's preventing some of our plants from recovering from those bushfires. Something you might even have walked past without noticing. This is a story about a different kind of pandemic, one that has decimated plant industries overseas, and that could easily do the same here, unless we can find a way to save the plants that are affected. But why save those plants? Why save any plants? Because our lives depend on them. Yours, mine, in fact, the lives of nearly every other creature on this planet depends on plants. They generate the oxygen we need to breathe. They produce the fruits, vegetables, and grains we need to eat. They protect the soil from erosion and give nutrients back to the soil. They filter pollutants from the air and from the water we drink. They provide habitat for the insects that pollinate our crops. And they provide food and shelter for a vast array of native animals. In Australia, plants like eucalypts and paper barks contribute to the unique character of the landscape and support our equally unique fauna, from koalas to pygmy possums and lorikeets to cockatoos. These plants are well worth protecting. And one of the things we need to protect them from is something very similar to the thing we've been fighting all year. A disease that originated overseas and has now become a destructive pandemic. This is myrtle rust. As you might guess from the name, it affects plants in the myrtle family, which includes eucalypts and paper barks. It's caused by a fungus that was first identified in Brazil in the late 1800s, and it's a natural part of the environment there. So Brazil's native plants aren't so badly affected. But in the 1970s, it caused terrible damage to plantations of eucalypts in the country. Eucalypts from Australia that hadn't evolved with the rust and so had no natural immunity. In the 1970s, a different strain of the fungus started making its way around the Pacific. It landed in Hawaii in 2005, and then Japan in 2007, and then China, Australia, New Caledonia. Indonesia, Singapore, and most recently New Zealand. In Australia, it was first detected in 2010 at a nursery in New South Wales, and there were initial attempts to control the spread of the fungus from there by practicing the horticultural equivalence of washing your hands and self-isolating. But the fungus produces spores that are easily transported by wind, as well as by animals and humans. And so, within six months, it had reached southeast Queensland. A few years after that, it was in northern Queensland, and now you can find it all the way from Tasmania to the Northern Territory. In Australia, the fungus has found a smorgasbord of new plants to infect, because the myrtle family here includes over 1,700 different species, and hundreds more subspecies. And that's a huge problem because while many plant diseases will only affect a few species in a family, a myrtle rust has so far been found to affect 375 different plants in Australia alone, and that includes eucalypts, paper barks, tea trees, lily pillies, and a whole bunch of rainforest plants. The fungus draws nutrients from the leaves, which causes them to die and drop off, and that can lead to complete defoliation. And repeated defoliation leads to plant death. The fungus can also affect flowering and fruiting, so it prevents plants from producing seeds, and so prevents it from producing offspring to replace the dying parent. If you went for a walk in subtropical rainforest a decade ago before the fungus arrived, you could have seen plants like native guava and scrub turpentine growing beautifully in many different places. Now those two species are critically endangered. Field scientists started monitoring these two species and several others not long after the fungus arrived, and what they've been seeing is first of all a thinning of the plant canopy, and then complete defoliation, and then death. In some populations, they can't even find the plants anymore. These two species 
are going extinct before our eyes. And there are 40 more very susceptible species that are likely to follow suit. What effect will that have on our environment? What effect will it have on the native animals that depend on the plants that are disappearing? Native guava is a pioneer species. It colonises rainforest edges and gaps. So if it disappears, it will most likely be replaced by a weed, like lantana, which is already a huge problem in rainforest here. Lantana increases the fuel load at the ground level and can serve as a ladder for fire to reach the rainforest canopy, increasing the risk of fire in a habitat that's not designed to be burnt. And while some rainforest plants can recover from fire, what we're seeing now is that plants affected by myrtle rust will produce new shoots only to have them killed off by the disease. So what can we do about it? Myrtle rust can be controlled in a garden situation using a fungicide, but that's not a healthy or a practical option for natural environments that span hundreds of kilometres. We can restrict the movement of susceptible species to places where the rust hasn't been seen yet, like Western Australia. But that's not effective on the East Coast, where the rust is already widespread. One thing we can do is preserve individual species ex situ, away from their natural environment, so that we have a store of material like seeds that we can use to return the plant to its natural habitat if a method for controlling the fungus in the wild is developed. And this is what we're doing at the Australian Plant Bank. Plant Bank is a conservation and research facility of the Australian Institute of Botanical Science, and it sits within the Australian Botanic Garden at Mount Annan in southwest Sydney. At the heart of the building, we have a seed vault, similar to the global seed vault you might have heard about at Svalbard in Norway. But where Svalbard preserves crop species, the aim of Plant Bank is to preserve our wild plants. At the moment, the vault holds seed collections for over 5,000 different species. If one of those was to disappear from the wild, we could withdraw it from the vault, germinate it, and put the species back where it belongs. Seed banking is a really effective way to conserve Australian plants, many Australian plants. And we have a network of seed banks around the country, the Australian Seed Bank Partnership, that is working on doing that in every state and territory. But for species so badly affected by myrtle rust that they're not producing seed in the wild, we have a few other conservation tricks up our sleeve. As a first step, we collect cuttings from as many individuals as we can and use those to produce new plants. That can be really difficult when the wild plant is riddled with disease because the cuttings have very little energy for growing new roots and shoots. But if we can get them to grow well, then they can serve as a starting point for generating tissue cultures. And that's a technique for growing plants in a sterile environment, basically in a little glass jar, on a kind of jelly that contains all the nutrients needed for plant growth. Once a plant is established in tissue culture, it's safe from myrtle rust and drought and flood and fire and anything else the environment can throw at it. But it takes a lot of work to keep a species in tissue culture in the long term, so the next step from here is cryopreservation. And that's a process where we treat the shoot tips with a kind of antifreeze, chemicals that stop the formation of ice crystals inside the cells, so that then we can store them in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, they can be kept in a state of suspended animation for a really long time. The plants that we grow by cuttings and tissue culture can also be used to establish living conservation collections in a botanic garden. And that's something we've done recently with the native guava. Plants from a few different individuals were put into a garden bed at the Australian Botanic Garden. And because the staff were able to control myrtle rust there, the plants have grown really well and produced hundreds of healthy seeds. Those seeds have now been tested to make sure we can store them in the seed vault. And the seedlings that came out of that have been sent to the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria and the Australian National Botanic Garden in Canberra so that we have additional backup collections. All of these collections serve as a form of insurance against extinction for species that are threatened in the wild. They provide a source of material we can use to return a plant to its natural habitat if it disappears and a source of material to boost genetic diversity in populations that are declining. They can also provide us with the material we need to do research to find out the conditions a plant needs to thrive. And for species affected by myrtle rust, 
they can potentially be used to find individuals that are resistant to the disease, and that could be returned to the natural environment even if the rust is still present. Myrtle rust poses a very real threat to our natural environment, and it's a sobering reminder of why Australia has such strict quarantine regulations. Fighting the disease now that it's so widespread is a really difficult task, but we're making headway conserving individual species ex situ, and with a lot more work, we might be able to bring those species back from the brink of extinction. In the meantime, there are two things you can do to help. Myrtle rust is still um, not in some places on the east coast. So if you find yourself going to a natural area, just make sure you clean your shoes and your clothes before and after you visit so that you don't accidentally transfer the rust. And one day when we can all go overseas again, you can make sure you don't um, contribute to the outbreak of a new disease by making sure you declare any plant material you bring back with you. Thank you.